the quick karakia, turn the mic on first, and then we'll, we'll get underway. Um, just before I do that, can I just check if anyone's got any objection to us live streaming this on Facebook? We're trying to reach as many people with this information. Um, okay, te pai, everyone's okay with that? Great, thank you. Okay, we'll bow ahead in prayer. Kia ino i tāpou a kamarama kamarama tāki ko te ata kori hiko te manu he manu kōrori he manu kōrora Haumi e hui e tāe ki he Cool Some housekeeping rules to get us underway So emergency exits in the event of emergency um, There's an exit straight to the back there which is probably the most obvious one um, You can also exit out the way that you, you came through If anyone's um, needing to use the bathroom you pass them on your way into the room, just head out here to your right and hang a right again, you'll be just here for your convenience. We've got mobile phones, if I could ask that they're on silent. Okay, we'll bear that in mind. Thank you for that. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, we have got handouts. Um, someone's handed around the information handbook, so you've got those in front of you. Um, there'll be a bit of a resource leaving the meeting tonight. And um, we've got some refreshments and stuff in the corner there, um, which we can have now or later. Um, just help yourself at your leisure. I'd like to quickly welcome our presenters tonight. You've met me, I'm James. Um, we've also got our Chief Executive, Nadine Thatcher Swan, and she'll be giving an overview on council. I'll be talking about the electoral process. And also, a warm welcome to Jim Green and David Scott, who are here from Hawara Tairapati, and just going to give a bit of a presentation on um, what they do as well. So thank you for being here. Okay, right, we'll bowl into it. And um, Nadine, you can give you the floor. Um, we'll give a shout out. I'm going to be the first to speak, so um, <laughs> bear with. Um, so just what I'm going to do tonight is just give you an overview of the business of council. Um, so you get a sense of what the organisations like, um, the acts and the rules that um, govern it, um, which if you were successful to be on council, you'd be um, working with, and I would be working for uh, you. So um, I thought I'd go over that, um, a bit about our structure and some of the issues and challenges, opportunities in our way, and let's thank you, in the next, um, in the next few years um, and foreseeable future. Um, so, just can I get a sense of how many of you know actually what the purpose of local government is without having a roll? Cool. So, our, so we're creatures of statute, and our um, our role is defined by the Local Government Act. We also have a number of other statutes that we um, have to adhere to, like the Resource Management Act, uh, Local Electoral Act, and so forth. Um, so, so our purpose was redefined, so under a previous national government they had this all well-being approach that got taken out um, and now it's been put back in by this coalition government. So we're basically there to enable democratic decision making um, and action on behalf of the community um, and also to promote the social, cultural, economic and environmental well-being um, for the past and uh, for the present and for the future, which is really important because that's about taking a sustainable development approach to everything that we do. Um, I just want to want to point out one of the principles that's sitting in there is around this whole sense of democracy and local decision making. Uh, so previously there was, um, before the Local Government Act came under the, the changes around it, was a focus on um, representative democracy, so that's basically I'm appointed and therefore I speak on behalf of. Um, in councils nowadays, it's this whole um, participatory democracy, so you have to, you are there, you have been appointed, but you're speaking with and you're gaining evidence from the community in order to speak, so um, there's quite a big difference in terms of how that, um, how that has changed over the years. So um, there are a number of principles that are outlined in Section 14 of the Local Government Act that um, the council has to, to abide by or give effect to, um, and the key ones being around transparency and accountability. So you'll notice now, um, some of you may have seen that some of our um, meetings, or most of our meetings, they are live streamed, um, and that is for us to try and give effect to this whole sense of transparency and accountability. We have a long-term plan document, so that's sets out what we're going to, um, our activities and how we're going to pay for them over the next 10-year 
10 years and our infrastructure strategy for 30 years. Uh, and we have to report on those annually. So that's the whole thing around councils having to be transparent for what it does and be accountable for its delivery. Now I've talked about the sustainable wellbeing, um, the sustainable development approach and the impact of wellbeing. We're also required to um, ensure that we provide for Māori to contribute to decision making and under the RMA for iwi to have input. Um, there is a sense that we should be collaborating with other local authorities and the council, we have a relationship with Bay of Plenty um, councils and what we call the Bay of Plenty um, the shared services arrangement where we join up around insurance and things like that to, um, to get uh, better buying power or um, better gains for the communities through better joined upness. Um, Commercial transactions, there's an expectation that if we are engaging in commercial transactions that we have sound business practices. So the council does have a commercial entity and I don't know if you know that we own the, or you own, we own the Gisborne Holding um, Limited which is council's commercial arm and they are responsible for our municipal building, the holiday camp, record testing, um, Tauwhare Parai farms. Uh, and other miscellaneous properties, and their job is to make money for the council to reinvest into our services. Um, we have to ensure that we've got prudent stewardship, which means we've got to effectively plan and manage money well, um, and I've talked about that last principle. So um, the council is one of, I think, six unitary authorities, so we've, we're quite unique in that sense. A unitary authority is an authority that combines the functions of uh, TLA, which is a territorial local authority, and they provide things like um, swimming pools, libraries, parks, dog control, building consents, yeah, and we combine it with the regional councils, so that there's big, bigger regional councils, and they're responsible for regional consent functions, transport, um, civil defence, science, monitoring, so we merge those two together that happened in amalgamation in 1989 um, and so we are quite unique um, relative to the other 76, 78 odd um, councils around New Zealand. So uh, we have, as you know, we've got a governance structure of five wards of which there are 14 elected members, one of which is the Mayor and we will be having a new Mayor um, this, this year. Um, we have about 300 odd staff, well I have about 300 odd staff, you as councillors, elected members only have one employee and that is me and it's my responsibility to employ all others. Um, and this um, governance structure is serving a population base of around 47,000 odd people. So I just want to make mention of that, um, that structure, 300 people. Uh, elected members of which there are 14 and servicing 47,000 population and growing um, is that in order to ensure that we're efficient in what we do, we benchmark ourselves against other councils and activities and we're required by law to carry out a service review of our activities to ensure that they're efficient and effective for the purposes of which we deliver them. Um, so we do that quite regularly and um, that just gives us and uh, the councillors and the community assurance that we're doing the best that we can do for um, for the money that we have available. Um, so I don't know how to get to these slides. Right? So this is just a diagrammatic view of around how I roll in the organisation. So there are um, six sections um, ranging from so, and I'll just work my way around from them, which kind of represents the complexity of the organisation um, that we operate in. So we have um, in a, up the top here the, in the rear transformation relationship. So that area is responsible for civil defence, emergency management. Um, it provides strategic planning to the organisation. It provides performance reporting. Um, and more recently, it's got the science um, environmental monitoring function in there. In the green, we've got livable communities. So that's responsible for parks and open spaces cemeteries, public conveniences, the pool, the library, the theatres, uh, integrated catchments, which is working around our um, environmental stewardship responsibilities, so working with farmers, farm environment plans and the like. Um, 
in the purple is James's area, so that's our um, people and capability development, that's health and safety, legal, uh, democracy support, and also information services. We have environmental services and protection, so I've recently just made a number of changes in there. So basically that's our regulatory function. So that's the area that looks after resource consent, compliance, monitoring and enforcement in our Harbour Master. So one of the um, responsibilities as a unitary authority is that we have to ensure that we separate our regulatory functions away from all the other activities in the council. Um, and that is because the council can also be a part, an applicant for a resource consent. And that team needs to be monitoring whether we're delivering on that consent. And so they need to be at arm's length to a certain degree in terms of how we operate. Um, Finance and affordability is basically your finance function with um, some risk and um, business intelligence reporting and that sits in there. And then last, lastly, but not least, is our lifelines area, which provides our network infrastructure, so our three waters and our roads, which we have um, just recently bought back in-house, our local road provision, um, and dissolved the Tairapiti Road um, well, entity that uh, we were in a partnership with NZTA. Um, so we're no longer in that partnership and we have now got our local roads back in house. Um, so this is just a list of what we do. Many of you will be familiar with our, um, our major projects. And then we have just over outlined all the activities. So there are about 28 uh, different activities across council. So just in terms of our money, and it's a really important thing um, to get your head around in terms of um, council's money and how it works. So we have, um, we're required by law again to set a key financial um, strategy and <clears throat> that strategy outlines how we're actually going to pay for the services that we're provo pro proposing over the long term. And so these are our six key directions. Um, Critical in there is um, to note uh, that in the last, in this long-term plan that we've got, we have a focus on critical activities and infrastructure. And relative to other councils, and we had a, um, we're doing a, a bit of work around our financial and revenue policy, is that the bulk of our funding is actually in these key infrastructure areas. So I think it's about 67, 65%. Um, so it does, demonstrate that we are actually delivering on our, our financial strategy in that particular area. Um, keeping rates affordable as practical. Practical. So that means, so we previously had um, in the last long-term plan a 2% rates increase, so it's a cap on rates. So, the, um, so in order to afford the infrastructure that we need and the services that we need to deliver, that was not sustainable. So the council engaged with the community, gave some different options around what you could afford to do. Do you might remember the wastewater treatment plant option, accelerate that or spread it out over longer. And um, basically what that came to was there about 5% uh, rates increase. So we now have 5% uh, rates increase. That's a, there's a cap on um, that. And there's also a cap on our debt that we could, so um, that we have. So we have $85 million in terms of debt for the first three years, which rises to $105 million, and that, that's where it will sit, unless there's anything significant that changes over the next five years. Um, that's, that's where we have put our um, debt, debt limits. Um, another part of council strategy is, in, is to ensure that um, we grow the rating base, so we've been doing a lot of work with Eastern Community Trust, um, and we've made a lot of changes in the past around how we deliver tourism and economic development, and we've seen the benefit of that through massive increase in our tourism numbers and a lot of um, an increase actually more confidence in the business um, community as a result of um, council getting out of the business but working around the business. Um, so we are big business, so we have about. $60 million per annum comes in in rates, and we have $2 billion worth of assets that we need to maintain. Um, so it is, uh, it is complex, and um, trying to manage all the moving parts is challenging. 
So this is our budget just as a breakdown in terms of what we anticipate that we would spend on CapEx um, and um, our sources of revenue. So basically that's like we're, we're relying uh, a lot on rates for 60% um, income rates, uh, which was a lot higher previously. So we've managed to bring that down lower as we gain more grant funding. Um, and that's, and we have been quite, actually we've been really successful um, in being able to gain external funding for our projects. Um, so you would have seen the provincial growth fund. Um, but not only with that, we've also gained lotteries funding, um, worked really closely with SE Community Trust to also get investment into our region. Okay, so that's just a calendar about it's just showing time commitment. So there are lots of meetings on and lots of committees that council has. So we have council, which meets um, every six weeks. We have a future focus um, committee, which is council as a whole called Future Tidapati, and it looks at the big strategic issues, major projects. Um, but and we have four regular standing committees, which is the environment. Uh, a finance focused ones, an asset one, and a community development one. This is all open to change. So as we go into a triennial election, what we do, our role is to review the effectiveness of that and propose um, other ways of operating, which we are likely to do. Um, this structure has been around for a very long time. Um, and so, uh, but it does give you a sense of the, the commitment that's required to um, council in terms of the meetings there and, and lots and lots of reading. This year, or just still me? Oh, it might be me. Okay, so what council does? So um, the role of the mayor and the role of all elected members is also outlined in um, our what are they called? Our delegations, and we also local have governance. the local governance statement. Um, so the role the role of the mayor the mayor does have some specific powers um, to set strategy and and policy but the mayor still needs the support of the councillors or the other elected members in order for that to happen. You can't unilaterally decide I'm going to do this policy and go ahead with it as a mayor. You actually have to get people on board to support you to do that. Um, he is, he or she is the spokesperson for council and advocates on behalf of the community and also acts as the justice of the peace. All elected members, your role is to set strategy and policy direction and also monitor the performance of council. Um, and one of the things is, is that even if you come in and stand in a particular ward, for example, you might be in Tarihiru Patutahi um, or you might be in the city, when you come into council, you are there to represent the district as a whole. And that's how um, the decisions are made. Um, and the other critical role is to employ me and review me uh, every, so I have a performance review annually, and, um, and then you select a, a chief executive, I think it's every five to seven years. Um, so the role of the chief executive are, is to um, implement the decisions of council um, and to provide advice, and actually that's the role of our staff is to provide you with the best quality advice that they can in order for councillors to make the best decisions that they possibly are capable of doing so. Um, the role uh, is to ensure that um, the activities or the decisions that you will make are legally sound, and I will tell you if they're not, um, and to maintain systems to ensure that we have good planning systems in place, um, that we've got good financial um, systems in place and that we're reporting well on them, and that's why we use sort of the use of independent uh, external auditors for our plans. Um, I'm also, as I said, responsible for employing all staff on behalf of the, um, the council. Um, and anything that elected members need from staff goes through the chief executive, not directly to staff members. Um, and then there's some rules around how we work together. And they're all set out in different bits of reports and legislation, local government government statement, a code of conduct, standing orders, et cetera, et cetera. But really, um, and I've worked in council for 10 years, this council, I've been chief executive for two of those years. Um, and my experience has, it's not, it's good to have that, uh, especially for new elected members, 
but actually it's really about the relationship that's created between the governance and the management of the organisation um, and trying to work together for the common good in terms of um, our community and community outcomes. So having clear communication, communication lines, respect for one another, um, and having clarity of those expectations is really important. <clears throat> so just in terms of the future focus, um, and there have been, there is a lot on for us, um, and climate change is massive, and it's hitting um, all local authorities quite hard in terms of what it needs to do to be able to respond to the various bills that are coming out, uh, the national policy statements that are coming out, um, also around freshwater, biodiversity. So we've got a massive changing legislative environment that is going to constrain, potentially constrain, or create uh, new economies. So that is one of our challenges, is to uh, give effect to all the different policies that central government is pushing down while also ensuring that our community thrives and grows. Um, we have uh, growth, which is a good challenge. Um, and I'm just gonna see what's on my next page, <coughs> so I might cover it off. Um, but part of that means that we need to then uh, resource up to be able to manage the volume like building consents and resource consents and then we have to monitor that and all that kind of stuff so the, the beautiful stuff that comes with growth is the resourcing up um we also have um so the employment relationships have been more complex requirements around health and safety these living wage discussions that are going on how this is going to impact operationally and financially on the organization is going to be a challenge that i will have to manage um, and then we also have the funding and financing um, issue moving forward. And the council is um, currently doing a review of its revenue and finance policy. So it's looking at how we uh, manage what is called our uniform annual general charge, which is a fixed charge to all households, and then our capital rates charge. And that, that does have implications for how people can, you know, the affordability in the community. So that is a big piece of work that um, the new council will be looking at. But there are also some uh, major opportunities going forward. <coughs> and one of the biggies that I talk about, so I'm required to deliver a pre-election report. Uh, and that pre-election report is for potential candidates um, that will be made available next week, which outlines my, from the chief executive's view, um, some of the issues and opportunities, and it's to help uh, elect, potential elected members um, have robust debates around what's actually what needs to happen in the council or, or moving forward. One of the biggest opportunities I see for us here is unlocking the um, collective capital potential from Eastland Community Trust, Eastland Group and Brisbane Holdings Limited. So as I said, JHL is our commercial arm, Eastland Group is ECT's commercial arm. We're all um, community-owned assets in some way. The council is the ultimate capital beneficiary of the ECT. So um, the organisations need to work to be together, and we have made a commitment to do so, to try and unlock what's sitting in our collective entities, which is hundreds of millions of dollars of capital, um, and, sorry, assets. So um, I think there's more to be done in this space, and um, we're gradually progressing that work. So that's me, I think. I'm yes. handing over to James. Unless there are any questions on questions. Any microphone questions? No, they're all, all sus. Uh, I think you yeah, probably just quite right, and I guess this is the, the form in, in which to say it. Um, I understand that you have clarified that, well, anyone that's going to be running for council you are going to be coming together as one, so that it becomes a collective decision. And now I get that, but what I don't quite see is that if you go closely along the rural towns, you know, out in the white wall wards, up the coast, and we've got, um, you know, because I'm Maori, so uh, and the demographics out there are slightly different to those that may be this way in the town. What I say is that when you go and run out there in those rural wards, they mandate you, and they propose you to put a mandate through to actually accommodate 
So um, the council uh, last year, it was 2018, undertook a representation review and the representation review as part of that is you can decide outside of that if you could add Māori wards. Yep. Council chose not to, mm -hmm. but what it did do is um, its final proposal was that there would be nine elected members elected at large. Uh, so you wouldn't have rural, rural wards, you would have everyone from everywhere voting because recognising that someone in the city may have interests up the coast, which is quite mm -hmm. good. Um, the Local Government Commission reviewed that and they overturned that final proposal. Um, and so that is why the status quo has been maintained. What the Council has decided, however, is that um, there is an opportunity to re revisit that um, and take a bit more time with the community engagement component to see if there is an appetite to then put that proposal again, which could also mean looking at Māori wards again. That is the job for the new council to do. So that is of that's kind of left there, yeah, for that that might. Any more questions? Now I'm actually standing in for Dale Oskoski tonight. He's our electoral officer for the forthcoming elections. Uh, based out of Auckland and he'll, he does a far greater job than I at this but I'll, I'll persevere and hopefully I won't bore you to death. There are a number of slides. Uh, the election process as you might imagine is, can be quite complex. It seems simple on the surface but underpinning it is um, quite a lot of heavy legislation, regulations, rules and so forth. So I'm going to do my best to actually step you through some of that process stuff um, and to give you a sense of safety as you go through these things if you choose to stand. Uh, just a quick overview. So we've got a population of 49,000 in Gizzi, um, elect elector base of around 33,200. Um, 33, Our election day is officially the 12th, Saturday the 12th of October. Um, and uh, we are holding elections for the Gisborne District Council using first past the post. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And Hauora Tairawhiti using the preferential voting system, STV. Um, they're held by the postal vote. So we don't have the ballot box like they do for general elections. As such, we use the postal system. Documents come out, um, you tick away, you put your numbers in and you send them back in and they get counted in Auckland. Uh, random order of candidate names, we've just got that in there because that's a fact for this election. Um, there are other options like alphabetical and pseudo-random. I won't bore you about the details of that, alphabetical self-explanatory. Random just means that, um, so same number of candidates but appearing in different orders on all the election papers. Um, pseudo-random is the one where you basically draw the names out the hat randomly and they appear the same on every election document and alphabetical. Right, I'll move along. So our nominations open up next Friday, people. So the 19th, Friday the 19th, is the official opening for nominations. Uh, they close 12 noon sharp. Not a second before and not a second after. Um, so I'll be what, keeping a close eye on that. It's really important that we stick to that because it can cause legislative issues if we don't. So uh, closing on the 16th. Uh, voting documents, sort of that week starting the 20th of September through to the 25th. If you haven't got your voting documents by the 25th, you've probably got an issue um, and you need to come in and do a special vote. Uh, voting closing on the 12th and then we hope to have some prelim results out around the same day, prelim results, uh, because there is a process to you know, get to that formal declaration, which we hope to do on the 17th. Um, and members come into office on the 22nd of um, October. 
So when we say the 22nd of October, we I'll talk a little bit later, but we that won't be necessarily our first official meeting of council. There'll be about a period of two weeks where we're going to do some some induction and some training and um, you know bring people up to speed with the role. We touched on this earlier. So in terms of the council election, you've got the mayor elected at large. So everyone in Gisborne gets to vote for the mayor. And then in terms of the 13 councillors spread across five wards, nine councillors for the Gisborne ward. And then we've got um, four councillors, one each for the four rural wards. And Hauwata Taira Fiti also appearing on the same voting document, um, seven members all elected at large, so all of Gisborne get to have a vote on who represents them around the um, DHB table. The two systems that we're using, everyone will be familiar with FPP, it's old school. Um, most votes win, pretty much, so um, you tick away and they get counted up and we tally them all up and we tell you the pecking order, basically. Uh, STV, um, I've got learned friends to the, to the left of me who know a lot more about this than I, but basically it's a preferential system and you number um, your preferred candidate number one, if you've got a second candidate you like, number two, so on and so forth. Um, my understanding is you can't put two ones, is that right Jim? You, know, you, 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 you start with one and you number your So, so I guess a shortened way of saying that is if you just like one person and you really want them to get in, you just put one. Right, there we go. <laughs> cool, thank you for that, Jim. Right, going to get a bit passionate, people. Buckle yourselves in. Right, so electoral, <laughs> um, we've got two electoral roles. The most familiar one you'll be aware of is the residential role, and I just want to do a big mihi to um, our young ladies that have come in from the Electoral Commission here tonight, and I see they've got a lovely pile of envelopes here if you haven't enrolled, I'm sure you have, or if you want to take those to people who haven't. So the residential role is the Parliament one, that's for people no matter where you live, you get to vote as a resident. Um, I spoke a little bit earlier about the ratepayer elector role, it's the little lesser known role. So this role is about if you own property in Gisborne, but you live, say, in Auckland, you get to enrol on our ratepayer elector role and you get to vote as a ratepayer. I call it the non-resident role. Um, what we know about this role, like this is a national issue, nationwide, there's not enough people on these roles because they don't understand that they have a right to vote as a ratepayer, um, even though they don't live in that community. Uh, we have 33 electors currently on this role. What we know is that uh, non-residents, so people who own property here but live outside of Gisborne, number closer to around 3,500. Um, and so that's sort of a freaky figure. Um, but that story is a national issue. It's not too different from other councils. So we're, we're putting a bit of effort into raising the profile around that option. Sure. Yeah, so they'll be voting as a resident where they live. So that's what our friends down the end here, for example, wherever they are, they get that vote. They get that vote as a resident, but they also get to vote where they pay rates as well. So, um, of course, we have people who are both ratepayers and residents. They go on the residential role. Um, I'm talking particularly about people who own property in Gisborne, live elsewhere. Yeah. Cool. And Yep. On the resident role and you live here? Yep, of course. Yep. So there's plenty of people who ain't rate payers. Yep, thank you. That's correct. Um, yeah, we, we do hope to set up a few boot, booths. Um, that's really, so that's not like a voting as such. You're just bringing your documents to the spot. Yeah, because the count is actually done in Auckland. 
um, but yeah, like they have the polling booths. What, what the distinction I want to make is that we use postal voting, so that's a continuous thing where you get to send them in. Um, the election day is the 12th, as opposed to the general election when we elect a national government, which is you go to the booth on the day. If you don't make it, you <laughs> don't count. Yeah, but we are looking at holding, having some uh, collection collection points or voting booths. Yeah. That's that's yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. We'll move on if that's okay. Right. Oh, um, eligibility is a candidate. So uh, for council, you need to be a New Zealand citizen, uh, eighteen um, or over, and um, enrolled on the parliamentary electoral roll. Uh, you can stand for multiple positions, so you can stand for the mayor and council and Hawara Tairapiti. If you're elected as the mayor, um, you take that office. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. You don't really get an option. You don't say, oh, I've stood for mayor and council, I want to be a councillor. You stood for mayor, you go for mayor and keep going from there. Uh, if you're a council employee elected as the mayor or councillor, you have to resign. Um, that's probably only for people like the employees in the room. Um, but it's just something to note as a rule. Talking a little bit about, Sorry. yep. As compared to obviously candidates and staff and some of the stuff that are pending, I think it's just as well. Did you hear that? It's just as good as well. Yeah. So if you're a council employee, you have to resign, um, but you can actually be an employee uh, on the DHB and elected. Yeah, good distinction. Thanks. Um, Elected members or your spouses um, with contracts with council, anything over $25,000, um, you may have to declare that to the Office of the Auditor General. Um, the Hawara Taira Piti candidates have a number of other restrictions. Um, and can you cover those, Jim, in your... No. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, it's the clause 17, Schedule 2, um, there's quite a pile of them, from what I understand. You have to declare different offices that you hold, so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that, relates, that relates to whether or not um, you or your immediate family or extended family will be engaging in contracts that oversee the financial companies. Right, oh. So, so, so in if you see our agreement online, you see that everybody has to declare anything. Any interest. Uh, they're involved in another company in town, if they're whatever it might be, if they're involved, if they're counsellors, they're involved in something, then that would be declared. Thank you. Which basically has to do with conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, in terms of nominations um, for council, um, we'll have the PACs here. And you can come into the front desk from Friday next week and collect those. Uh, key points to note in terms of that nomination process, you cannot nominate yourself. Um, uh, and very important that people understand that the two people that do nominate you are from the, the ward or the area that you are wanting to be elected for. So if it's for the city ward, obviously people on the role, whether it's um, on the parliamentary electoral role who are nominating you from um, that ward. So, yes? Uh, I know this is another question that was asked earlier, but uh, anyone from Kaiki or other people would be happy to speak with them. That's correct. Yeah. What's your aim of prosecuting the thing if like you live upon the rural board as a veteran? It's where. Do you it in town as well? Do you support? Yeah, so the. Dis uh, so, no, it'll be as you're listed in the in the role. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you're registered to vote um, and your address is in the Gisborne ward, then that's the one that applies. Yeah. Not the residential, That's correct. So if, you, if you're if you enrolled in Gisborne and you've got a property in the Gisborne ward and that's at a, as it appears on the roll, that, then you can nominate someone for that ward, even if you live and rent a property yes. further up the coast. Okay. But you should, but if you're living up the coast, you should be enrolled for that area. Yeah. Righto. So nominations. Um, very quickly, you need uh, to fill in the form correctly, um, follow the rules, $200 deposit. Uh, there's an opportunity to provide um, a 150-word candidate profile statement. 
um, really strict on the 150 wo words because it gets put into a national system and it won't let you put any more words. So we have to get a bit creative about using hyphenations. No more. No, that's correct, up to, no more. Uh, recent passport size, recent passport size color photo. Emphasis on the recent, yeah. We don't want to see your high school photos if you haven't been in high school for a long time. So I think the recent has been, you know, within three to six months, I think, but it has to be a likeliness, okay? Um, the, the nomination uh, deposit can be refunded if you satisfy the rules as well. So if you're within 25% of the lowest successful candidate using the FPP, so council, council um, process, then you might be eligible for, or you'll be eligible for a refund. And uh, in terms of STV, it's 25% uh, of the final quota um, within Kui of that. Uh, Candidates are able to have an affiliation, so that's a group or organisation, or you can just declare that you're independent or you don't have to have an affiliation. Um, so there are some rules around that as well, unacceptable affiliation. So you get some people, you know, you see on the voting document, it says standing is all an in independent, which means they're affiliated to no groups. That's why people put that in there to say, I'm not, I've got no other allegiances or whatever. Um, those affiliations can't they can't cause offense um, they can't cause confusion and it can't be a slogan you know vote for me part of the dream team or whatever <laughs> there we go nominations close as I said earlier 12 noon sharp on um, Friday the 16th the other thing too that is now a rule is you must state your on your form um, your principal place of residence. It is, it is on the nomina in the nomination packs, that's correct. Um, and that's, that statement needs to be for all the positions that you stand for as well. So for example, if, um, if I wanted to stand as the mayor in Invercargill, which I can do, and I live in Gisborne, I need to say that my normal place of residence is Gisborne, so that people know when they're voting that, oh, this fellow's from Gisborne. Not from Invercargill, righto. Campaigning, so that started. Um, you can start campaigning any time now. That's a, that's a rule that's changed. Um, election signs are permitted on private, private properties. And we also have seven council owned sites. And they're in, I think it's about page 29 of your candidate book actually. Yeah. Page 29, and it sort of gives you the policy and the rules around that. Um, you can start displaying six weeks before the election day, and they must be removed by Friday midnight on Friday the 11th. So that's obviously the day before election day, they have to all be pulled out. And everything's in that book there. In terms of election advertisements, um, signs, notices, pamphlets, web pages, so on and so forth, you need to show the details of the authorising person. So you'll see a lot of election hoarding say this sign is authorised by so and so and so and so. It doesn't extend to Facebook posts and tweets and stuff like that, but all that sort of official print material in particular um, needs to have that statement on there. It's an electoral offence to not have it. Uh, just the rules. Um, I think it's um, people want to know um, who's putting that stuff out into the market um, in terms of electoral hoarding. No comment. Um, <laughs> candidates or the agents um, can't collect voting documents, so that's a big no-no. Again, I'll talk about electoral offences, so you can't go out and start collecting everyone's voting documents for them or whoever's supporting you can't do that. People need to take that responsibility on themselves and um, make sure that they return them or put them in a post. And like I said, there's... Um, quite a number of electoral offences. I'm not gonna go into them in great detail. Um, they're in the book here at page 46. Um, they're in the legislation. They cover quite a number of different things. Um, okay, so in terms of that campaigning stuff, candidates, uh, there's election expenses rules and um, there's limits on these. So I'll just quickly read of them off. The mayor can spend in his camp with his or her campaign up to $30,000 over their campaign. Um, the Gisborne Ward, so where we've got nine 
councillors um, up to 20k each and all other wards 3,500 and it's a 30k limit for anyone standing uh, for high water tide uh, Those Those limits are inclusive of, inclusive of GST um, and you can't add those limits together. Um, <laughs> right, oh. <laughs> uh, it's, there's the applicable three month period before election day that relates to the expenditure. If the expenditure is before that three month period, um, it has to be uh, fairly at proportion to cost the three months. So if you start spending beforehand, um, it's still confined the amount to the limit and spread over those three months. There's a really important thing, and, and this is something that uh, electoral officers chase up quite a bit. Towards the end of the process, um, we need, and this is whether you're successful or not as a candidate. Um, this is a distinction. People think it's only for the people who get elected. There's a form, an election expenses form that must be filled in. Uh, they are required to be collected and they are on display for seven years and now we are now required to advertise them on websites. Yeah. Yeah. Is that so? Yeah. The other thing you've heard is that the last election is it's alleged I'll say the steering activity that people can't even get the process now possibly changed with the county so what, what, what happens with electoral offences is they need to be reported to the electoral officer. The electoral officer has no powers of investigation. They take those allegations and they hand them to the police and the police are required to investigate and do what they need to do under the law. So it's related as a criminal activity. Um, so uh, electoral officers, I've been in this process before where people come to me and what are you going to do? Well, all I do is what the law requires, take, take the allegation, make note of it hand the matter directly to the police and the police take that process from there. So if you're aware of anything like that, um, you usually do report that to the electoral officer first and then they, um, you know, work through it and decide whether it's a matter for the police. How can the electoral police Very, yeah. Straightforward form. Yeah. Not all forms are like that where elections are concerned, but I can guarantee that that one's pretty clear. <laughs> Okay, um, I've covered that. So candidates can appoint scrutineers. Uh, they can, so scrutineers, that's someone you can nominate to be um, on your behalf, go and look at what's happening during the voting um, process, whether it's on the day of counting um, or whether it's during the opening of uh, the documents to be counted. Um, what I would note about that is that obviously our process is done in Auckland like a lot of other places. So your scrutineer, um, there's very little that they'll be able to do. They could watch the special voting process here if they wanted to in Gisborne, because we conduct that in these offices. Um, and the other major things would be um, in, in Auckland. Uh, you can appoint a scrutineer in Auckland. There we go. So if you've got someone in mind there, um, they can be your scrutineer. They don't have to be from Gisborne. Uh, they need to be over 18. Uh, they need to be appointed before noon on the 11th of October. And yeah, as I said, the voting centres and the processing centres in Auckland. Uh, I don't think I need to cover too much of the, um, the results. So to close, like I said, 12 noon on the 12th, um, we'll have some results out that day. Around 98% of the vote should be counted by um, 2 p.m. on that day, uh, and we'll go through a process of advertising, uh, so on and so forth, and all the results will be available on the council website, www.gdc.nz. Uh, right, uh, got the information handbooks there. They're like a Bible for this process for anyone who's serious about standing. Um, Dale Skosky, electoral officer, I call him the godfather of elections. He's, he's pretty top notch on this stuff. And we've also got our deputy electoral officer here, um, Heather Conn, and I'll be backing Heather up in terms of assistance and, and, and helping as much as I can. Um, you can attend council meetings. We've got a few still on. Um, read agendas and minutes to get some look and feel for what you're in for. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think the biggest agenda in my time here has been in the vicinity of 728 pages. Oh. It was exactly 728 pages there, I've said it. So, you know, we do have some hefty reading and quite complex stuff. Um, so if you're really serious about standing, it is a big commitment. Um, and you need to understand how you're going to balance um, you know, your, your public office with the other lives <coughs> as well. Um, but it's a really, it's a privilege to see the council and make big decisions and changes for the community. Okay, talked to staff members, you know, quite helpful. Um, talked about Dale and that. Yeah, so in terms of being elected, um, what if you're elected? I guess, first of all, you celebrate. Um, and we'll have a, we've got, we're revamping our induction program to make it more fit for purpose. Uh, and so Heather and I are working hard on what that's going to look like. And we're going to take benefit of the two week period um, from the close of the election results and the declaration period through to our first inaugural meeting and utilize that time. But induction will be ongoing. Uh, you know, we're going to build in the sort of financial, financial knowledge, um, asset information, um, that's a whole pile of stuff, conflict of interest and how to manage that sort of stuff. Um, and, and the other thing I wanted to know, it's a paying job. So you get paid to be a councillor. Um, and those rates have just been reviewed. Um, but, you know, for an average of around 20, I reckon 22 hours a week, um, councillors receive around 38,000 dollars a year. A real councillor receives a little bit more because of the travel and stuff involved. Um, if you're a committee chair, sort of 42 odd K, uh, the deputy mayor currently receives around 49,000 and the mayor is on 141,000. Uh, so, you know, because it's big money, um, you get a salary. I think that's it. Unless there's any more questions and I'm sorry to have taken so long. I just say, James, in terms of if you were elected Those of you who may be interested in, in joining our board there. Yep. So, um, Kawala Tairawati is one of the 20 district health boards in the country. Uh, district health boards are set up under, uh, under the New Zealand Public Health and Disability Act and also the Crown Entities Act. So a little bit diff of difference there in relationship to, to the council. And we have a, a board of 11 members who, as I just said, uh, seven of them are elected by the public uh, of, the, of the district, and the other four are appointed by the Minister of Health. When you're on the uh, district health board, you are actually working for the Minister of Health. Uh, you are um, uh, different in that respect than a council, and uh, the Minister of Health uh, has the uh, authority to, uh, to uh, remove people from office uh, and... Uh, so that's just a, another different uh, matter there in relationship to the district health board as compared to the council. District health boards have the responsibility for the health of the population that they serve. Uh, and uh, here in Tairapati, that's the whole of what is the Gisborne District Health Board's um, uh, district. Uh, so that's our district as well. Uh, we uh, stand very strongly for uh, the, uh, the health and independence of our community. We have an absolutely particular focus on health and equity for Māori, uh, and that's one of our most important and uh, abiding uh, actions as, as a district health board. Uh, and so a lot of our business is around uh, that particular area. So as a district health board, we've got uh, a dual role. We both fund and provide health and, and disability support services within our district. Uh, and so that means that uh, we fund uh, all of the, of the services uh, for health within the district here, and also we uh, provide all those services, so services, for instance, at Gisborne Hospital, 
uh, and other parts of the, of the district as, as well. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, we, uh, another difference is that we have an annual plan for the district health board, which has actually got a, a, a it's called an annual plan, we've got a three year focus. Uh, those are our plans and our statement of intent are provided to parliament. We are overseen by parliament. We report directly to parliament. Uh, we have to appear at uh, the health select committee on a regular basis. Uh, and our accountability therefore is therefore to the government uh, and also to the people of the district here. We have uh, a thousand staff uh, and, um, and uh, the board has just the one employee, but like the council, the employee consists of the one employee, that's me as the chief executive. Um, so what do we fund? So I think people often don't understand that as a district health board, we fund all of the, about 80% of the cost of people's visits to general practice here and primary care services through our, our two primary health organisations here in Tairaki, Pinnacle and Ngātipo Hauwara. Uh, we fund the three iwi health providers, Tūranga Health, Ngātipo Hauwara and Hauwati Hauwara. Uh, we fund uh, rest homes and health and hospital care for uh, people who are eligible within uh, rest homes and aged care facilities here in Tairāwhiti and, and at Ngātipo Hauwara. Those are, that's roughly about 80 to 90 percent of the residents that are in those, in, uh, in those institutions. Their care is funded by the District Health Board. We fund uh, home-based support services for people, for old people in the community, so that's home health and personal care services for people within the community. Uh, that's, well, we've just been out to 10 for that, changed our provider of that. That's roughly about $4 million per annum of care that we provide in the community. We fund all of our mental health services here in Tairāwhiti, and uh, that's primarily through our own district health board, but also through other organisations such as, as Tūranga Health and Ngātipo Hauwara. Uh, we, we fund uh, laboratory services here, so we fund a T-Lab to provide all the laboratory services in the hospital and in the community. And another factor there is also that because we're a district health board and we are receiving funding from government for all of the health services required by Tairawhiti citizens, wherever you go in the country and need health care, we fund it, we pay for it. So if you need to go out of district to get a service, you, you need a, you know, an operation in Hamilton or you have a heart attack and you need care in Hamilton, we pay for it. You get sick in Invercargill and go to hospital in Invercargill, we pay for it. Uh, that's roughly about uh, $17 million per annum that we pay for our people here in Tairawhiti going out of district. Uh, and the other area that we pay for is for your medicines. Most of the cost of your medicines, you pay your $5 charge when you go to uh, uh, the pharmacist to pick it up, but we pay for the pharmacist to dispense your medicines and uh, we pay for most of the cost of that medicine as well. So, um, in terms of uh, what we actually provide, um, I think most people know around Gisborne Hospital and the services that are there, that's just a brief listing of those there for you. Uh, so that's that other component. Roughly of the funding that we get, and I'm going to talk about the funding in a minute, but roughly of that funding that we get, uh, just a little over half of it goes into providing all those services at Gisborne Hospital and all of the community-based services that as a district health board we provide and, and the rest of it goes on to all of those other areas that we fund within the community. We're roughly now this year, we are a, 20, a $200 million business. Uh, so um, that $200 million is what we use to, provide, to fund and provide all of those services for people within our community. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it says there in the smaller print, it's, it's never enough, tough decisions must be made. Uh, this financial, the, year, the financial year that we've just uh, completed on that $194 million budget, we're roughly going to be about $12 million, uh, have a deficit of around $12 million, and that's the deficit that we are projecting for this current financial year that we've just started on. How does it work? Uh, we rely on what's called deficit support from the government. So the government uh, tops our um, bank account up on a uh, one, about once a year um, to, to calculate. So it's a, it's a 
it's an agreed deficit that we have. The government has said, yep, that's, that's your agreed deficit. And um, they give us more cash on a, about a once a year basis. Um, and yeah, that becomes what we call equity within the, within the organization. Well, it's really, it's really very, it's a very difficult organisation or a, or a company to, uh, to fund because the, the health is open, you know, three to seven, three hundred sixty-five days a year. So you can look at the past few years and see how much money was spent on your medicines, on your drawings, on on the uh, uh, detention practices, pharmacy and make some assessment. But what you really even know is what's going to happen uh, as far as people getting sick uh, during the year. So uh, it's really quite difficult to make it extremely difficult to make it. Well, like, like you mentioned just before about Michael and Eve, uh, they don't get the same pay. I agree. Uh, Michael and Eve are just getting half the headache. So that makes it quite difficult for, and our board has always taken the view that the patient is the one that's most important. So the red ink at the end of the year, as though we weren't really hard to try and uh, avoid having a, a national bank, we need to put that to shove because the board believes that we can do the best we can for the people that we serve. And that's what we do. So, sorry, yep, no, you have another question? Yep. To make it all work, it's just as true as the framework of like figure or some form of framework and um, yeah. How does that reflect that? Is that a bigger picture or is that like um, based on a long term plan of how we get to it? Yeah, so. Um, what we do is was, was within uh, government policy around health. Um, so we have quite a lot of direction from government around what it is that we have to do within that, within the funding that we get and within our role as a district health board. So we get a lot of direction there, probably more direction than a council would get. Uh, and also we've got that account accountability back to government to deliver on what we have said. So our annual plan outlines, outlines what we're going to be doing in the year. And we have to deliver on the annual plan. So and that's how it's going to fit in that framework. Yes. Yes. Are. Yes. Yes. And we obviously, you know, we are we you know, we've got our clinical services which operate around clinical model, we've got our funded services, we've got the direction that we want to go to, go in as a as a district health board. And obviously, as I said before, one of those directions is around Māori health and improving Māori health. So those are those are the sorts of, of directions we want. We want to bring more services here to be in here in Tairapiti, as opposed to sending people out. These are some of the things that we that we look to do as a district health board uh, within that within that degree of funding that we have. Yeah. The other thing about that also is, and partly related to the deficit, is that we are seeing more and more people requiring health services within our community. We are seeing more people coming to the hospital for admission, more people are being admitted. Uh, and we're seeing within, within primary care, within general practice, within our services within the community that we find more people needing those services as well. And of course, uh, you know, one other big thing that is happening at the moment, which is a following on from the government's uh, inquiry into mental health and addiction in our country, uh, there are a number of recommendations that the government is wanting to implement that district health board are very firmly a part of in terms of implementing that. So there's a lot of work going on currently around our, how our, our, our um, mental health and, and drug and alcohol services are actually planned and delivered in Tairapiti. And if you were elected to our board, one of the first things that you're going to be doing in February 2020 is to actually make some decisions about what's going to happen with those going forward. So that's the sort of work that District Health Board, the board is actually uh, going to do. Um, just a little bit about the board itself. As I said, we've got uh, uh, seven, and seven plus four members. And uh, just on that as well, uh, the chair of the board is appointed by the Minister of Health as, as, as the, the deputy chair. And uh, that, those are those decisions that get made after the elections and before the, the board comes into place in early December. Uh, but the board also has, in the middle of that diagram there, three statutory advisory committees, so required by law. There are three committees there in the middle there. Those are the Community Public Health, Hospital and Aged and Disability Support Committees. 
They are separate committees to the board. They provide advice to the board. They're made up of board members and members of the community, different organisations and representatives on a, on, a, on a process that the board actually appoints those, of those people. Uh, they cover off those three areas. When it says hospital, it's not just about the hospital. It's about all of the services that the district health board provides, such as our community mental health services, for instance, that we provide as well. And then as you're looking at that on the right-hand side of that diagram, so we have a question. On the right-hand side of that diagram are a number of other uh, committees of the board that, are, uh, that uh, you as a board member would be a member of, appointed by the board to be on those, and, um, and a principal amongst those is our Māori Relationship Board, uh, which is a, uh, a group between ourselves, iwi here in Tairākati, and other representatives of Māori within the community. And then on the left-hand side of that diagram there are very well-developed relationships with the two uh, runanga here in Tairākati. And although it's in the iwi partners box, but not an iwi partnership, our relationship with the Pacific Island Community Trust. So how we are integrated and working with those um, tribal authorities and with the Pacific Island Community Trust around improving health outcomes for Māori uh, and Pacific people here living within Tairākati. I'm not sure if I want to take this, David, or you're going to take this one. So those are, those are, the, those are the key areas that the board works in. Um, as far as the community board,
can be really disheartening if you join a board and with a passion for changing one thing at home. And so, you know, so, 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 so that becomes quite, that becomes, you can become quite isolated if you just can't join the board because you want to be paid. Um, have free medical care totally safe is yours. That's what you want. And so that's what you're passionate. So that kind of change really doesn't happen at the level that if you want to do that, you really have to actually you have become to a part of the MP. Yes, yeah. Come and engage. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. Okay. Um, uh, that's just really just talking about. Uh, just a, you can't read it, I'm sure. Um, but just really, I think it's important to recognise that you know on the district health board, a lot of the work that we're doing is around very much around improving health outcomes for people. So we do a lot of in, provide a lot of information about what it looks like now, where we're going, how it's changing, uh, and as on the district health board, your role is to actually be advising us and talking with us about how we might be more effective with that because that's our whole our whole thing uh, while we exist. David, I think you've already done um, what's it really like um, that slide about why you might stand, what's involved. You might want to talk about the amount of time involved that you think. Yeah, so. It's a bit hard to tell. It depends how, how quickly you can read and how how, how well you uh, are able to, to disseminate the information and form some sort of pattern. But um, as a, on a, a typical meeting, so we run a different style. It's probably more mildly co-proper as far as our concern. So the topic will be put on the table. Um, you don't have to go through the chair. You, as long as you're polite, you can talk across the table to get a point of view around the topic that you're handling. And then I'll listen very carefully, and then at some stage we'll, we'll draw that to a close. We'll have a summary around the table of what people think. I think uh, if, if seven or eight people think it's a good idea, then it happens. So it's not moved and seconded or anything like that. It just happens, and it's recorded as is. And if people don't really feel they uh, feel strongly that they don't like that, they can have their name removed because that, that's it. I mean, that's a piece of business, so it's quite, it's not, it's not your typical British style meeting anymore. It's certainly not in the board. Is it safe to say you've done for is two hundred dollars, but if you get more than twenty five percent of the quota, yeah. you don't have to. You get your money. You get more than twenty five percent. You get your money back. So the chair, so the chairs around New Zealand, we meet regularly. We also meet month, we meet as a region as well. But one of the things that causes us a lot of grief is the voting process. So you have a mixed bag. So you have people who are ticking candidates for council, and then you have people who are putting in a number in a box for the health board. So I think from the last election there were seven hundred of the health board papers that were invalid. So if you multiply that by, let's say each person wanted to have a say about five, that's you know, 700 times five, it's a lot of votes that just disappear. They don't count. It's really, really difficult. So it's not just our board that, that happens, it's because that's the law at the moment, that if you're going to have a, a vote for health, you have to have so that's a chief, chief, chief case. Would I be right in assuming that the denomination is the top sum town coming along and saying, well, if we go run for council, I'll put my name to the top of the 
I'm not I don't know whether that's entirely the case. I, I think a lot of it is it's a, it's a uh, complicated um, system, and there are a lot of people working behind the scenes. I mean, the money goes somewhere. Yeah. And yeah, so that's basically paid for the. Yeah, yeah. But, but you're hoping they're going to get it back. You're just going to get a bit high, high pole. That's not too much of a surprise. I don't know if you want to mention anything. I think we've covered all of those last points, David. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll cover another question. It's probably an answer for one of you tonight. But <laughs> there was another council meeting on the record of day. A council meeting on the record of day. Yeah. Yeah, so we had um, in the meeting that we had a, had a picture up there with the governance work program. So we had six working group meetings. And that's what we're going to use these five years later in the council to go back to the My thinking is going to go with this is that someone brought up on such and such a day. I'm not going to call the governor for it. Correct. And we we set the program um, yeah. pretty much well in advance for what that's on the that's what that's the most of what that's going to be. There are um, workshops that we should have been there that come from the council and those that are still in play. Okay. Hey, uh,